Hello, my name is Jen Gad. My Dharma name is Wan Jian, and I've been coming to the temple for about five years. I am so happy to be here this morning to talk to you about being a busy Buddhist and some ideas about enhancing our practice beyond meditation. At the end of last year, I learned that as a temple, we would be spending 2023 focusing on chapter two of the Red Book. I thought, okay, maybe it's time for me to really dive into this Red Book, which is what we call the canon of the fundamental teachings of one Buddhism. Up to this point, I had really just been reading random things here and there. So I looked over the scope of chapter two and discovered that it was only like 35 or 40 pages. And I thought, an entire year devoted to 30-something pages? That is something I could do. <laughs> so much of chapter two is like a question and response with Wan Buddhism's funny teacher, Master Sotesan. As I was reading through the chapter again recently, one of the verses that kind of jumped out at me was verse 27. I'm going to read part of it now so that you can get an idea of what we'll be focusing on today. The founding master came to a son session and said, Yi Inuiwa has now had such a great arousal of the mind that she neglects her private business in order to attend Dharma meetings and join son sessions. Instead of giving her an award for her devoted faith, I would like to allot this hour to her. Ask any questions you may have. Inuiwa asked, if someone asks me what we teach and learn in our order, how should I reply? The founding master answered, Buddhism originally teaches one to awaken and know for oneself the principle of all things are created by the mind. And you may answer that we teach and learn the same principle. Once we know it, we will also discover the principles of neither arising nor ceasing and the retribution response of cause and effect. So, the practitioner Inuiwa in this passage is on some level the direct opposite of me. I am a member of the temple and I attend Sunday service online or in person every week. And according to Reverend Wangong, faithfully attending Sunday service is admirable and something to be celebrated. However, the temple also offers Dharma and meditation study opportunities during the week that at some point I plan to attend. But for now, my husband went back to school last year. I have a full-time job and a part-time job, a house and three kids. In other words, I'm super busy. I'm definitely not showing up here online or in the Dharma Hall for studies and group meditations as often as I'd like. But something about this passage drew me in and I kept reading it over and over. First of all, Master Sotesan delivers this extremely important teaching to a female disciple, which stood out to me as forward thinking. Not only that, but Anuiwa was a single mother who was working hard to balance her personal life and her spiritual one. I strive to be more like Anuiwa. But in the meantime, how do I and how can we all maintain a solid practice even when we cannot join activities and programs at the temple during the week? Well, for that, I've got a plan. <laughs> Being called to and falling head over heels for Wan Buddhism a few years ago as an adult with two jobs and three kids, I've had to balance my busy life with my Dharma study from the get-go. I reflected about the way that I personally practice as a Wan Temple member, and it seems that much of my daily practice beyond sitting or movement meditation falls into three categories. One is practicing conscious awareness. The next is getting myself back to a mindful state during the day. And the last is engaging in something called bite-sized dharma. First, we can truly have a practice that neither arises nor ceases. Understanding the Buddhist principle of neither arising nor ceasing is difficult, and in my years of study and practice, I have just begun to scratch the surface. For me, thinking about this principle in terms of getting back to my own true nature is helpful. Our true nature is who we are at the core of our being that is exempt from the effects of sensory conditions. Our true nature neither arises nor ceases. One way that we can get back to our true nature is by being in the present moment, just as it is. Simply by noticing things with conscious awareness, we are able to glimpse our own true nature, and even if it's just for a second, it can be enough. So I work with elementary school students, 
Talk about little humans who notice literally everything. For example, not even one adult noticed that a few months ago I got new glasses, but a bunch of my students did. So how can we be more like these kids who are almost constantly in touch with their present true nature? We have to just literally open our eyes and pay attention. So a few years back, I read a neurological theory that now reminds me of conscious awareness. The theory could be summed up in this way. Human brains are prediction machines in that experience develops expectations. Perception operates by employing prior probabilities that are efficiently deployed to reduce the processing requirements of treating each new experience as completely new. So, in other words, our brains take shortcuts as a way to save precious processing time and space. This hierarchical prediction machine approach has some pretty interesting implications. Okay, so we're going to do a fun little conscious awareness mind experiment now. So you can close your eyes or leave them open however you feel more comfortable. So your job is simple. Picture a tree. Just picture a generic tree in your mind. I'll give you a second so you can really see that tree in your mind's eye. Okay, now remember your tree. Okay, we're done with the brain workout. Good job, everybody. So because our brains are so amazing and so efficient, when you encounter a real tree in nature, you will not see that specific tree in front of you, but instead you will see your mind's eye tree, the same one from a few moments ago. And this theory makes sense when you think about it. Imagine that you're walking down a tree-lined street and you had to fully process each tree that you saw. You wouldn't be able to make other really important judgments like, is there a car coming? Or is there a hole in front of you that you're about to step into? So this is where conscious awareness comes in. If you consciously and with awareness look at a tree in nature, look at the leaves, look at the branches, then you'll really see the tree. Otherwise, you'll just see that same cartoon-like predictive tree that you saw in your mind's eye a few moments ago, and not what's actually in front of you. So you have to employ a certain amount of conscious awareness in order to truly see the real tree. And any kind of conscious awareness you employ puts you right into the present with your true nature. So this is one way to embody and better understand the principle of neither arising nor ceasing. So let's move on now to the principle of cause and effect that Master Sote-san writes about in the verse that I read aloud. The principle of cause and effect is another way to describe impermanence because everything is always changing. One way to embody a practice that teaches us about cause and effect is to periodically get back to a mindful state during the day. When we are in a mindful state, we are more likely to act in a way that is in line with our true nature, and we are more likely to pause before responding to something we perceive as negative. So the good news is that we can get back to a mindful state in a habitual way, so that after an initial amount of effort, the rest is easy. So this will look slightly different for each of us. I have mindful checks throughout my day that begin with my morning stretches and continue throughout the day. Thankfully, my brain is trained to see these opportunities for mindfulness because I've previously put in some effort to form a habit. So you can choose any action you would like to associate with mindfulness. Say that you've chosen the action of getting a fork from the silverware drawer. That's your cue for mindfulness. At first, you will have to think about it quite a bit. And you might even forget sometimes, but that's okay. Once you train your brain to associate picking up the fork with getting back to a mindful state, you will be practicing the principle of cause and effect. The act of picking up the fork is the cause where you're planting the seed of mindfulness. And the effect is that you will go about your day, or more realistically, at least the next part of your day, in a mindful way. I've done some research on habit formation for this talk, and the consensus is that it takes about 10 weeks to reach the final stability stage where the habit will become mostly permanent and you won't even have to work at it anymore. So our brains are actually wired to seek out habits because they are cognitively efficient. Why not then form a habit of mindfulness? Whatever your day looks like, you can insert a few mindfulness cues, like sweeping the floor or turning on your computer. And it's a stone in the path of our understanding greater, the principle of cause and effect. So the last busy Buddhist topic I'll discuss today is engaging in what's called bite-sized dharma. 
There's actually a website called Bite Size Dharma that has hundreds of links to Buddhist stories and quotes and anecdotes that I check out periodically. If you are attending in person, I have made a handout sheet that will be in the back after the service, and it will include all the resources that I mentioned. If you're joining online, I'll put the same information in the comment section of the YouTube live stream once that is posted. The great place to start your bite-sized Dharma journey would be, of course, our temple's media offerings. Our North Carolina temple has a podcast as well as a YouTube channel for Dharma Talks. The Wan Dharma Center also has YouTube offerings. And it's really easy to choose a topic you're interested in, and most are only about 10 minutes long. A third bite-sized Dharma option is the Tricycle Foundation. Many of their communication pieces are free, like the Daily Dharma that consists of a quote with a little paragraph discussion. They also have a free Daily Dharma podcast. Finally, I saved their best for last. Years before I bought this red book, the Doctrinal Books of One Buddhism, I downloaded the entire thousand plus page book as a PDF for free online. And while I love having an electronic version, I eventually bought the paper copy as well. So I'll end my talk with a tiny story about being a busy Buddhist. So about a month ago, I woke up way before my alarm, riddled with anxiety. And I said to my husband, Anthony, I don't even know where to start. I, ha I feel so overwhelmed with all the stuff that I have to do. And his answer was simple and yet profound. He said, well, maybe you can make a list, prioritize, and do as much as you can with mindfulness. And that is all we could really do. We live in a busy world, and many of us have very busy lives. But by embodying a practice that neither arises nor ceases, we can understand better cause and effect while striving to be more like Inuiwa, one of Master Sotesan's most devoted disciples. Thank you.